Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the next one. All right. So again, thank you so much for coming and uh, welcome from a humble supporter of this event. And uh, thank you, Finance Latvia Association, for doing this. I'm still getting acute, you know, to this new name, but it's a great name. You know, Finance Latvia Association is the, now the name. And for the European Commission for doing this. Um, so I am, I am just a practitioner. I'm a realist, a little bit of visionary as well. But, you know, in the essence, I am I'm just a lawyer, right? And what can a lawyer tell you about uh, blockchain and things like that? Well, lawyer can tell you something about the law and regulations. So this I am going to speak about some regulations. But then I thought on such a fantastic summer day, uh, when you don't think much about regulations, right? You think about sea, you think about sun, you think about sand, right? So, therefore, I will talk about regulatory sandboxes. So, uh, a bit relevant topic. Um, and I also have to say that, uh, you know, in preparing for this topic, we uh, gathered vast amount of information, but don't uh, be afraid, I will stick within the 10 minutes. But um, I have to say many thanks to my colleagues, Lionel Elde and Sanda. You know, we have massive amount of background information for this subject now. Um, but, you know, regulatory sandboxes, it is very interesting and actually relevant topic. Because these, these are the platforms where those fintech companies uh, can, you know, be set up. They can operate, live, and prepare for the big game, prepare for the uh, compliant game, prepare for actual work, um, compliant with the rules and regulations as they should. So this is, um, this is what the regulatory sandbox is. And when we look at the world, I mean, the footprint is very impressive. These regulatory sandboxes, I would say, if you look at it, I would say it's, it's, it's Asia, right? It's Asia, it's definitely Europe, it's North America, the most, uh, the most popular spots for these uh, regulatory sandboxes. And, uh, you know, if we were doing this in Asia, probably there would be uh, people saying, you know, Asia is the leader. But based on all the research, I can say with quite a confidence that actually Europe is the leader or seems to be the leader in driving these uh, technologies and actually also accustoming the regulatory base. Uh, and I, we will get into a little bit of those details, but obviously we cannot cover everything uh, within these few minutes. But just let me give a few examples what a regulatory sandbox really is. So, um, what, uh, what are the criteria? I think the first, and doesn't it across the world, it just needs to be open. Right? The regulator needs to pick up the phone calls from the companies. The regulator needs to be able to speak to the companies, explain. And I think this is the one very single fundamental uh, attitude point because the fintech companies need to feel that the state, the regulator, is welcoming, that they are speaking in their own language and try to, you know, get to the solution together. I think this is the single most important thing. But then, of course, um, other, other things. So what, what else? There needs to be a certain process how these fintech companies get onto the platform. It cannot be too bureaucratic because I think, you know, two, three months is an optimum timing for these fintech companies to register, get into the platform and start the testing operations. Then another thing is uh, security, yes? So usually these, uh, when, when a fintech company gets into the kind of the, the full, fully operational sandbox, 
it needs to be kind of secure in terms of the clients because it is not yet regulated. It's not yet probably fully compliant. So usually they would put something like 100 uh, clients as a limit. They would put certain li limits on the uh, operation with real money. Usually these projects also operate with just, you know, uh, imaginary money. So this is this security concept. And then there needs to be a clear path to graduation. By graduation, I'm meaning the exiting the regulatory box, getting compliant, and getting into the market and doing the business. So this is, this is in a nutshell what these regulatory sandboxes do and what they, how they operate. And when we look at these geographics still, uh, of course, this is a new thing. There is no history. Like when Latvia became independent, we could renew our constitution, we could renew our civil law, right? But there is no something like, you know, a blockchain law was not in place 100 years ago. So, and this is across, uh, across the entire world. And we see countries taking extremely, also actually different approaches. We can take a look at Singapore and we take a look at Hong Kong, very different approaches in Asia. We can take a look, for instance, at in Germany uh, and Switzerland. We will see uh, Switzerland putting in a fully functional regulatory sandbox and thinking about it. Germans uh, taking a more cautious approach, but I like Germans because the Germans, uh, our legal system, by the way, is German, German law based. And Germans go easy. They say, okay, well, we learn how to apply our law. And they basically say, okay, when it comes, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, fintech, when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to, for instance, they say ICO. What is ICO? They say ICO is IPO, right? So because our laws are applied by analogy, and this is just the way to apply the law properly, right? And also, you know, other things like that. So therefore, you know, it's, it's very diverse, very, very diverse uh, way how different uh, countries are applying these laws and setting up the sandboxes. Now we will take just a look at a few of those examples and I can highlight the most relevant, just, you know, few ideas from several jurisdictions. UK clearly needs to be mentioned, UK is the pioneer. UK has a fully functional sandbox, but not only one. In one sandbox, they already have five sub-sandboxes, right? They call them cohorts. And this is, these the companies register there, they test, they graduate, and it's already, uh, you, you can see, uh, 276 applications received, and uh, uh, it's already starting the cohort five. I myself, uh, our law firm, we had the opportunity to, for instance, work on one of, uh, one of the projects together with, um, you know, our UK colleagues. It's uh, 2030. I just spoke with them very briefly yesterday as well. It's an interesting, interesting um, uh, fintech company who will test their solution together with London Stock Exchange. I must admit, it is also, it's a crypto related, it's Ethereum infrastructure related, but you know, it's also something which they're developing together and the London Stock Exchange will also play ball and get involved. And so you can see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you can take a look at the, um, if you want to see real practice examples, this UK sandbox is the one where to take a look because they publish it all. So, um, going on Singapore, an interesting uh, example from Asia. Singapore also very progressive, putting a sandbox in place. There are already graduates. This, for instance, this policy pal one. It is the insurance policies uh, based financial technology solution where people can get easier access and can manage their various insurance data. And, uh, well, what is interesting for Singapore is they have put those hardcore things which cannot be, there's non-negotiable items like AML, 
like fit and proper criteria for honesty, uh, data protection, handling of customers' monies and assets, that is non-negotiable also for fintechs. And there are the items which we can say where is more, you know, where the regulatory regimes can adjust to facilitate fintech operations, like, uh, like capital requirements, liquidity requ requirements, you know, things like that. So that is interesting also in terms of our policy making as an experience. This slide shows the life cycle of a project in a regulatory sandbox. I will not repeat myself, so it's an application, pretty fast, evaluation and experimentation stage. Switzerland is very interesting because it's very close. Swiss legal system, extremely close to our uh, legal system. Their civil code, also very close to our civil code. And Switzerland is, in Europe, one of the most advanced in actually putting the regulation already in place. They allow fintech companies to take public deposits up to a certain amount. Who can guess or who knows what is the amount in Switzerland without regulation for fintech company to get public money? What do you think? Million francs. Million francs. So, bingo. One million, but it's already, it's quite, you know, without regulation, but there are two criteria. Do you know what, what about getting this money? It cannot be for, it cannot be reinvested and it has to be interest free. So this fintech has to actually convince with its technology, the users to put the money in without an interest and on the obligation not to reinvest it and plus uh, it has to be extremely liquid, I mean returnable upon first request. But you see, what, and without any regulation, and once they get over this one million, they need to apply for this fintech license thing, which is from one million to 100 million Swiss francs. A again, a more relaxed regulatory environment. Very interesting experience. From Belgium, I can mention only one thing. They are adding an interesting tax incentive for they are looking for talent. And they are putting those most talented, you know, I don't know how they actually, um, you know, evaluate them, but probably by education. There is a tax incentive. They can get 30% from their payroll taxes uh, back or, let's say, reduce their payroll taxes in their own pocket by 30% if the highly qualified uh, experts get involved into the fintechs. So that's a tax incentive. What we are doing in the Baltics? In the Baltics, uh, uh, the regulatory sandboxes idea has not passed unnoticed. Uh, Bank of Lithuania, which is the regulator in Lithuania, is putting in place a, regu a regulatory sandbox as a fully operational, as they say, as of uh, next year, right? So, but let's see whether they will actually deliver it on it. So far, um, so it's, it's, it's the planning, but they have also opened their uh, consultation resource. They are also very uh, welcoming to fintechs. Estonians also going the same way. They are also creating a live testing environment sandbox, but that's also not yet fully operational. They are on the way. In Latvia, what we are doing in Latvia? In Latvia, uh, there, is, there are two very nice persons, Gunta and uh, what was the name of the other person? A very, uh, you know, welcoming young lawyer who are picking up the uh, phone calls and they are actually speaking to the people. They are speaking to the fintechs, they are explaining the path to regulation, explaining the path to licensing. So Latvia's uh, FCMC have also opened a regulatory sandbox which is more, you know, demonstrating the openness, speaking to the uh, people and consulting them. So far, Latvia is taking this pragmatic approach in a way that uh, there is no uh, plan 
to actually set up a fully functional, uh, you know, testing uh, sandbox. But I would say also for Latvia, uh, every country needs to think about its own resource, it's about its capability, and like it makes sense. Yes, so there is no one pattern that fits all. In my opinion, putting regulatory sandbox also in Latvia could probably be already like yesterday's news. Maybe in Latvia the best way for regulator is to team up with the current, with the business and with these, in these technologies hubs to like work together, develop and facilitate. And I was also saying to the Ministry of Justice, it's not the Ministry of Justice fault like that there is no regulation in place because this is uh, the business needs to drive it, right? And then the regulation needs to follow sens sensibly. But one thing, one action point in which I would like to uh, basically close is for Latvia. For Latvia, I think the most important would be, it's like with Brexit. What, uh, um, what businesses want from Brexit? Tell me one word. They are not afraid from Brexit, but they want what? What do you think? What businesses really want? Clarity, exactly. And this is what the fintechs want from the state, clarity. And it's not only FCMC. It's other institutions as well, which need to come together. It's FCMC, yes, but it's also Consumer Rights Protection Bureau. It's, uh, it's the State Data Inspectorate. And definitely last but not least, tell me one other very important, you know, agency collecting money. State Revenue Service, yes, all these four need to come together and deliver just the clarity for fintechs, how they can operate in Latvia. And that is the one action point on which the government, not on changing laws, but on changing the approach and clarity need to deliver. And just to finish, uh, and I will not repeat what you already said, EU is definitely putting together the experiences from all the uh, member states. There is this um, action plan how to harness the opportunities presented by fintech. And uh, one is special, you are also putting together a blueprint with best practices on regulatory sandboxes. And then, you know, de depending on that, I think also Latvia and other EU countries can take their best route going forward. So, ladies and gentlemen, it was a great pleasure to uh, speak to you today. And uh, so, just a few things. Um, you know, main thing is to share information. Don't copy, but share and take the best out of it. And stay until the end of the event. Thank you. Bye-bye.